The question is, will state funds be used to finance construction? Will city funds um, from the in lieu fund be used? Does anyone have an answer? So, so these are, um, I think, one of the, um, the benefits of the program is that this is the creation of, of middle-income units without a public subsidy. Um, so I, I want to be really clear. There is no local, uh, scarce local dollars going into the funding of these developments, nor is there state funding. Um, I'll tell you, as somebody who, you know, at City Hall, I would love if the state and the federal government got more into the housing business to help us out a lot more. No. Because I don't know if you're looking and paying attention to the dysfunction in, in D.C., but the reality is, as the more dysfunction goes on there, the more the cities um, bear the cost of that. And we have to take on the burden that the state and federal government does not. The other part of that question is EV5 growth. That's part as well. I don't know from the 2010 census where those EV5 zones are. I know that they're using that one in downtown TL. I'm wondering, I know there's one blob in the sunset somewhere where that money's going to come from. That's, that's foreign investors who right. give $500,000. Yes. They buy a visa. So, so, sir, you can explain the program better. Than yeah. So it is. It is basically a, a program that allows, um, if you will, visas for uh, foreign investment. Um, as far as I know, um, I'm not aware of. I mean, I'm not aware of its eligibility when it comes to this program. Um, I, I'd have to study that more. To be honest, I, it's not something that's come up in the course of our discussions. Got a couple of questions here about concerns about uh, if any area of the lower Great Highway is in the soft zone and people again are concerned about their views. There's been a lot of concern on next door about parts of the lower Great Highway. Can we address that, please? Will you define soft zone? Everybody says yeah. that word, but you don't know. Very good question. So uh, I think Kirsten just put up a map, but essentially what the state law and what this local law mimics is that it, it takes out all the RH1 and RH2 zones. So what you're left with is um, some of the shaded in areas. And so there are parts of the Great Highway, I believe Kirkham and north of it, where there are some RM1 and RM3 and NC1, I believe, areas. Those are all, yeah, okay, thank you. So those are all places that would be eligible for this program. But I want us to take a step back. In order for someone to, in order for the development to occur, property owner needs to want to develop something. Number two, they have to have the resources to do so. Either they're going to sell the building or they will finance it somehow themselves and raise money. Third, you have to get a developer that actually wants to invest in the Sunset District. I'm not sure how many of them really feel that our parcels are worth it, to be honest. Yeah. All right, okay, so if, if they were, we would have seen a lot more here. So in any case, there's a lot of steps that need to happen in addition to the planning process review uh, that, that all of the neighbors actually get the input on if there's a specific proposal. There's an appeal process that often goes to the Board of Supervisors if neighbors uh, do not find a project acceptable. There's a lot of steps that have to occur. So when I saw that there were blanket statements about all of a sudden we're gonna get these seven-story buildings on the beach, that is very unrealistic, okay? So impossible. You're allowing it, though. Anyway, so I'm going to let Kirsten answer the rest of the question, but I, I just went through the steps of how actually difficult it is to get a project from start to finish. So I don't know if any of you own your properties and, and you're worried about your views being destroyed by other developments. Don't sell your buildings then. <laughs> um, so I think there's been a, a question about... <laughs> Okay, uh, do we all need to stand up and do jumping jacks? Um, uh, there's been a question about soft sites, so I'm just gonna explain what a soft site is. Um, and it's, a, it's basically um, a way for the city and planners to understand which sites might, benef might, might kind of be redeveloped because they're currently being underutilized as, design as defined by like the very rational economist mind. So what I could get if I built 
a building here is worth more than what the land and the building is worth. Mm -hmm. As Supervisor Tang pointed out, there's a lot of issues with that. Like there's some soft sites in this city that are soft, but unfortunately they're owned by 40 different family land trusts and they can't actually all get together and agree. So we've got a giant parking lot in the middle of a transit corridor, which is, or, or like right, I'm thinking of actually a giant parking lot right on the church and market uh, sort of intersection right at a, a muni stop. But what I'm saying is the, the way we picked our 240 sites was sort of just doing that basic math. Your community has already gone through a much more detailed process in the Sunset Blueprint where you looked at what's actually on the ground, who owns the land, who are the tenants, are the, the commercial tenants the owners of the land, might they be interested in maintaining their business? And there are a very small set of soft sites. I think it was 1,100 units that were total be available on the neighborhood commercial corridors. Mm -hmm. Our study found that basically of the total program, we think about, I think it's four or six percent would happen in your district. So we're talking about that same thousand units. And that's over the full life of the project. Excuse me. So we're monetizing everything. The yellow Peter is going to repose a question he had that Jeff would like to answer. So just to keep us moving forward, oh, or did I interrupt a question? Yeah. 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 Sorry. So if, if I could understand it correctly, you were asking us to go back over and look. Um, what does the soft zone mean? So you're okay. saying like everywhere outside of the yellow zone, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. In the yellow zone. RH1 and RH2 can be developed, is that what you're saying? No, no, no. No, no. no. no RH1 or RH2 parcel can be part of this program whatsoever. We're not, this legislation does not change any of the underlying zoning. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I think well, what we help is to say the name of those streets. Yeah. 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 So there's quite a bit on Terravel. There's some on Judah, some on Irving, I believe. Great Highway and 48th, it's Kirkham and north of that. And La Playa. And La Playa, it's north of that, uh, the Kirkham. Slow, there's a little sliver of RM3, I believe. There's a current project that's going on right now. The largest project that the Sunset District has seen in about, I think, a decade is about 52 units being developed currently. That was entitled about six years ago. Oh yes, I'm sorry, Noriega is another commercial corridor. So, oh, sorry, so you know all the four corridors. It's Terrebel, Judah, Noriega, and Irving. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question was about why do we want to put stuff onto uh, tsunami and liquefaction zones? So again, Basically, we didn't cherry pick what the zones would be and that would qualify for the program. Essentially, we were mimicking what state law did, which was strip out the RH1 and RH2 zones. What you were left with was, is what you see on the map. And that includes um, the portion that is north of Kirkham and north of it, Great Highway 48th La Playa, that area. So again, nothing is off the table. We were in discussions about what are some of the maybe restrictions that we may want to place on the program. Uh, given that there is potential sea level rise, uh, our office has been working and we're like the only supervisor's office working on the Ocean Beach Master Plan and addressing sea level rise and everything that is going along with it. Uh, so again, those are all things that we are taking into consideration at the moment. It is not a guarantee. So uh, I know that you have a building out there, right? And so if, again, if you're not going to be selling the building, there's not going to be a development on your particular building, right? Mm -hmm. And if there are if there are threats to liquefaction and tsunami, don't put new housing. This is this is for absolutely, and that uh, as I mentioned is something that I already spoke with uh, you know our planning department about. So this these were all things that came out of what you said to our office. So yes, that is being discussed. Uh, I've never said anything about alphabetical streets, so. Okay, uh, Susan had asked me to repeat one of the questions that we'd had, 
Uh, but before I do, I, I, I'm going to use my mic opportunity. Just to clarify, uh, you asked the question about infrastructure. Kirsten talked about the new transportation sustainability fee, which is going to presumably be adopted next Tuesday, by the way. It will be at the board for adoption. It's important to recognize that all development up to 20 units in size is exempted from that. So it only applies to projects that in this neck of the woods are at, you know, mid to large size projects. Everything 20 units and smaller doesn't have to pay the fee. In addition, keeping in mind, again, these are objective but factual, that fee doesn't go locally. It just goes to the Muni to be able to use for the network citywide. So it may or may not relate to where development is happening. Um, the question I was asked to repeat is what happens when you have existing rental housing that's demolished and you have rent controlled units that ostensibly cannot be replaced because of state law? Do you get those units back in kind and do those residents get a right to return? So, folks, by a show of hands, how many of you are tenants um, living in the district? Just so I understand the, the numbers. Generation. Fourth generation. That's great. Um, so, to be really clear, we don't expect this to happen very, very, very often. But this is something we, it's an issue we have to solve for. So, you know, we are very concerned. We do not want to incentivize the wrong thing. And as Peter Cohen mentioned before, when you kind of move forward with a piece of legislation, you have to think about all the different possibilities. And this is certainly something that is on our plate, and we are intend to solve it. We intend to come up with strong protections for the residents, for the tenants, um, and we intend to have uh, something similar to what Peter discussed, which is unit-by-unit unit replacement along with a right to return. Um, uh, so we are looking at that, and we want to make the strongest uh, protections possible through the course of this program. So I just want you to know this is something as we move forward that we're going to introduce. Um, we want to have um, the best protections possible for residents, so um, we're not losing residents as we build more housing. That is not the intention the of the program, nor something that we will achieve. What about the rent control aspect of it? So, again, if I return, do I return at my present rent? That is that is absolutely the right question to ask, and that is so, and that is an issue that we. I'm telling you, folks, that's an issue that we have to solve for. And, what and about so we, two years it's you know, I, I don't want to over, I don't want to overpromise something, but we are working for it. When he moves out, is that unit still a rent-controlled unit? No, it's just like now. So is that like so? We are we are looking at. Allowing so if if this was to occur in very very limited circumstances, we would require the BMR units to be replaced with it, which in many ways is a higher level of affordability than what a rent control unit would be. The next question, sir, you may ask is is that rent comparable? And so that would be something we would have to look at and solve for. So we understand the question. I want to. We understand that this is an issue that we have to address, and we intend to do it. I have two more questions I'm going to read and get answers to, and then we will politely take questions from the audience because I know you guys have been very patient, and I'm sorry I yelled at you. <laughs> I'm trying to run a tight meeting, and I think you can all hear me. I have an outdoor voice. Um, Stand closer to the mic anyway. Okay. <laughs> This one, um, and we may have answered this, but it's asking if developers can buy out of affordability and still um, get the increased density. I think the answer is no, but I'll let... Um, Under this proposed program, no, no, no. The city has already an existing inclusionary housing requirement that applies when a project is 10 units or more. There you have three options. You could build 12% affordable units on site you could pay, a, you could, sorry, you could build off-site 20% or you could pay a fee that's equivalent of 20% to the mayor's office of housing for them to partner up and develop the housing. But under this affordable housing bonus program that's being proposed right now, no, you cannot pay a fee and opt out of it. I also want to take one step back because I know there's a lot of concern in the community, especially those who are living along the beach. Even if this legislation is passed, developers have several options. These are all optional programs. They could decide that they do not want to participate in this program because maybe that is 
something that works out more for them financially. They can decide to opt into the state program and there may be unlimited uh, requests that they can make in terms of concessions and waivers to the planning code, including height limits. Or another option is they can adopt or participate in the local program, which is what we are trying to shape right now. So all of these are optional. The developer could actually choose to not do or opt into any of them. I'm going to pose one more question, and it's a complicated or several part one because elements of this have been coming up, and it has to do, and I'm going to ask Katie to answer this, with the timing. Again, let's talk about the timing of the different elements of this legislation so that you will know what's happening when. And then one question that keeps coming up is, can this be withdrawn and resubmitted again in a different format? Thank you. So just to repeat the timeline again, we still have to do our outreach to all 11 districts. This is the very beginning of the conversation. Uh, without, you know, y this is one set of concerns. Can you imagine the 10 other districts that may have their suggestions as well? So Planning Commission does not intend to take formal action on this item until maybe December, and that's tentative. Only then can it travel to the Board of Supervisors Land Use Committee. We have not even requested a hearing there yet, so I have no idea when that's happening. But we're looking at 2016 at some point, and we need to do the outreach to all the districts. Uh, I think my colleagues would be very upset with me if I didn't reach out to any of them, okay? So that's, that's reality. In terms of amendments, you can actually make amendments the Planning Commission, you can make it a Land Use Committee, you can even make it at the Board of Supervisors, okay? We hope to gather all of your thoughts so that we can incorporate all of uh, what is feasible uh, to address some of these concerns. Secondly, uh, I'm not the main sponsor of this legislation. I cannot withdraw the measure. The mayor is actually the main sponsor. I can take my name off of it. This is still moving forward. It's going to be a train moving along without all of your input. I'd rather be part of the discussion and incorporate what your concerns are so that it really reflects truly what District 4 cares about as part of this citywide program. So again, I, I cannot withdraw the measure. You're going to have to talk to the mayor about that. But seeing as how he wants to comply with state law, I don't think that he's going to withdraw the measure. We are at the end point of the planned meeting, but uh, the library is open till 9. If we are cleared out by 8.30 at the latest, and a few of you help us stack the chairs, we can stay longer, and I think the panelists are willing to stay a little longer. So let's take questions from the floor. This gentleman is standing. Um, I, uh, and can you I shout? Have, I will. Um, I have two questions, but they're very interrelated. One is... Uh, I thought that under the state requirement, it was only uh, buildings of 10 units or more that are required to have these bonuses. Where it, that is incorrect. Where did where did I get the? I, I, I heard that probably three times. That that's probably our local inclusionary housing requirement. Right. That applies to buildings of 10 units or more. That's existing law right now, where if you have a new development, 10 units or more, you have to build 12% on site. There's no density bonuses or height increases associated with that. Is there any minimum that. size under this local ordinance that's being proposed? Yes, state law requires that we offer the benefit for any projects that are five units or more, and so we've kept that minimum. Okay, so a four unit project would not be involved? Correct. Okay, that's that's good. Now, second question is, uh, it, and it relates directly. Um, I'm very concerned about my local neighborhood commercial district. I'm not in your district. I'm over in, in District 7, but or part of it in District 5. But our local uh, neighborhood commercial district is designed, it's an NC2, it's designed to preserve local neighborhood serving businesses. They're under threat. There are businesses closing because they can't afford the rents. But there are a number that are, have survived. One of them, for example, is a market that is one story high. And uh, it's a big lot. So what happens when somebody comes along and says, I want to build a, a 15 or 20 unit building on that site, that market's gone. and We don't have a market anymore. So what about protecting these areas, is it required let's, that... Let's let them answer the question I, I, so more people can get their questions gotcha. answered. I, I just and wanna, particularly I just wanna, people it, that live in District 4. I understand. Really I understand. Well, but, again, uh, there may be people who are concerned I, I, in District 4 with that same question. Oh. Finish okay. the question. Okay. The question is, 
do we have to include this program in small neighborhood commercial districts like NC ones and twos? Is it necessary, or can we avoid those kind of small scale uh, areas? So first, I just want to answer the question about what happens if someone wants to, you know, build on an NC corridor and they want to remove the the ground floor retail. Actually, if you're by nature of the fact that you're on an NC corridor, whether it, and that means neighborhood commercial, either one or two you have to have commercial on the ground floor. That is a requirement. So you could build on top of it, but you have to keep that bottom commercial space. But the rent will go way up. The rent may go up anyway. Well, again, there are neighborhood commercial controls where we actually say no formula retail in some of our areas. Uh, you may want to think about that for District 7, but I certainly, we have that in place for District 4. But and I know question. Supervisor but Tang we, will stay after to answer do questions. Do we have to have Other NC2s people have included? questions too. Do we have to? Uh, Is it required? Uh, can you stand? That's a really good question. I'm not trying to cut you off. I'm trying to let other people yeah. ask questions. It, so this lady is, part of the question. This lady so is standing. Let her ask the question. <laughs> ask the question. <laughs> it's 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 part of the same question. Okay. Okay. We, we want to make sure other people have opportunities to speak. I'm an owner out in Ocean Beach. I am very concerned about the proposed changes to the height limits. Yeah. 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 The, 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 the neighborhood worked on a community plan yep. with Supervisor Tang's office, and, all, and we agreed, yes, we have to add more affordable units out here, but within the existing framework was yes, the agreement of the community. Yes. I, I realize that maybe we would like more development out here, and we have to offer something to help encourage that, but as to the point made about what what are we getting out of this deal, I, I can't imagine that developers, we're talking about ocean front property that some is empty right now, so it would be quicker to develop than displacing residents. Some of it is empty, like the lot next to the Thai restaurant and anyone who lives in that neighborhood knows what I'm talking about. I can't imagine, we have to give developers the ability not probable, but the ability to go to seven stories to encourage them to build ocean front yeah. condominiums. I can't imagine we have to offer them seven stories no. oh, and it's, that only has three buildings. We tell them what to do. We tell them what to do. The question, and I know, again, I heard that a lot, and we try to address that. Uh, I know there's been a lot said about seven stories. The existing high limit is four stories. They can only get up to seven if they build 100% affordable housing. That is not realistic. The city... Per- six if they do 30%? Six if they do 30%, 40% two bedrooms. It's still too much. So I hear six is still too high. So as I answered Tomasito's question earlier, we are looking at those properties by the beachfront, okay? So that is on the table for discussion. Absolutely, because I've heard from many of you the concerns about that. And like I said, our office is the only supervisor's office working on the sea level rise issue, okay? So I hear you. I'm a resident of the Great Highway as well, okay? So I I understand, okay? So... um, we will certainly take that back. We will share with you the results of our conversations around all of the amendments, including potentially addressing the ocean front properties. But again, please stop saying seven stories. That is not possible. Six is possible. City provides two to three. 100% affordable housing units each year. That's the only way you can qualify for potentially three-story increase, okay? They said on a bulletin, that was why that, we saw that, the bulletin. Yeah, yeah that's not, yeah. that was not produced by our office. Okay. I'm glad these questions are coming up because these are the concerns people have.